Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Apex Frozen Foods Limited Q2 and H1 FY24 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this call is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Chaudhary Karturi, MD and CFO. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us on this investor call for the second quarter and first half of FY24. With us on the call today is uh, Mr. Dukha Prasad from our finance team, uh, Ms. Madhavi from our operations team, and uh, Stellar IR Advisors, our investor relations advisor. We have uh, uploaded the investor presentation on the website of the stock exchanges, and we hope you have had a chance to go through it. Now, let me begin by going through the uh, numbers for the quarter. The net revenue for Q2 FY24 came in at uh, rupees 242 crores, uh, a decrease of almost 22% year on year, led by uh, lower volumes by almost. 13% year-on-year, and lower realization by almost 10% year-on-year. Lower volumes were led by continued uh, subdued demand from our key market, which is the uh, USA. The total volume sold by our company stood at uh, 3,084 metric tons in Q2 FY24, as against 3,565 metric tons in the Q2 of last fiscal while uh, promotional activities by retail and food service companies, uh, that is, uh, the distributors for restaurant chains, are being carried out, uh, the impact of such activities has been quite uh, gradual. Uh, from the company's end, we are we are uh, have initiated uh, setting up a wholly and wholly owned subsidy in the USA for support with regard to logistics and also development of the market in USA and the rest of North America, which is the primary focus to uh, support customers as well as both on the logistical front uh, and to plan programs. Um, on the other hand, sales of markets such as the EU are doing quite well. Uh, in fact, uh, sales to US, uh, sorry, to EU market have posted a strong growth of almost 63% year-on-year and almost 100% quarter-on-quarter in Q2 FY24, and a growth of almost 50% in first half of FY24. Consequently, the share of EU in overall sales mix increased to 40% in Q2 FY24 and 28% in first half of FY24 making it a more diverse sale mix. Now, uh, coming to the realization part, as you might be aware of, the global shrimp prices have been tapering down due to the weak demand and the supply scenario. Further, in our case, uh, on the front of uh, ready-to-eat products, RTE, uh, led by change in geographical mix, which is a higher share of EU where the RTE products are not sold yet also impacted the overall realization in Q2 FY24. As a result, the average realization of uh, the Q2 for the year period Q2 FY24 came in at rupees 738 per kilo as against rupees 820 per kilo in Q2 FY23. However, there has been some improvement in the prices when compared sequentially. Our uh, average realization increased 6% quarter on quarter, despite lower share of RTE in Q2 FY24. We hope the prices remain firm and remunerative for the shrimp uh, industry players. Coming to the profitability, we are pleased to share that some of the costs that had surged unprecedentedly high post the pandemic has now corrected. This, along with our cost control measures, have 
help uh, improve the profitability with uh, the EBITDA margin higher by 300 basis points quarter on quarter to 8.1% in Q2 FY24. On the balance sheet side, I would like to reiterate that our debt continues to decline as we judiciously use our surplus cash flows to deleverage our balance sheet. In the first half of FY24, we reduced our debt for further by rupees 7 crores to rupees 83 crores as on 30th September 2023. The debt to equity ratio remains favorable at 0.17 times. Um, our working capital cycle too is seeing good improvement. The achievement underscores our commitment to improving our financial health and, of course, underscores our uh, prudent management of resources. When it's coming to the demand centers for our company, uh, in the case of the USA, which is uh, still our major market, we understand that the situation is easing slowly, and as we had mentioned, it should be better in the next couple of quarters, more towards the end of calendar year, um, you know, as we look forward to the holiday period uh, sales, uh, when most of the sales uh, during the any year happen. However, uh, the consumption also would be improving during that time, uh, as mentioned, uh, considering that most of the lower-priced products are also available at disposal for the consumer base. Once the inventory backlog is cleared, which is in the process, and we are cautiously optimistic that we should see a revival in the demand, that which we could be foreseeing, um, yeah, we, we are currently foreseeing happening around the, the last quarter of the fiscal year, and uh, look forward to a, you know, a better or a, you know, a, a better fiscal for the next year, basically. So typically towards the end of this uh, fiscal year, current fiscal year, we should we are positive that uh, things would be uh, changing a little bit with, on the demand side with the consumption happening in a better way during these holiday sales. So that was with regard to the U.S. market. And uh, uh, also in the, in the U.S. market, uh, the retailers where most of the promotions have, significant, uh, have taken effect are definitely having a good impact uh, with regard to uh, increase in volumes, and of course, our retail customers are also uh, planning for the next fiscal year uh, as we speak, uh, next calendar year, sorry, as we speak, and they are also planning the programs with regard to the U.S. market. And with regard to the EU, too, the but as we have been mentioning to all of you, uh, we are eagerly waiting for the approval of our new facility so as to be able to export our high-value, ready-to-eat products to this very lucrative market. Uh, and this has been pending, in fact, uh, for the past uh, I saw more than three years. And this is more of a um, uh, deliberations and uh, negotiations between the EU and the European Union Council and the Indian government, which is, uh, we are hoping, actually, we are seeing some um, you know, positive signs, and we are hoping this gets completed uh, positively before the end of this current fiscal, at least, so that we can start uh, exploiting the potential of the ready-to-eat products, even in the new market, to where our customers are positively awaiting, so that we can we can go ahead and look at that business. Uh, in the EU market, also, we definitely foresee some good sales happening during the holiday times, uh, in the upcoming holidays. And uh, as per the information received from our customers, um, we are uh, so, so we are looking forward to that so that the overall uh, impact on the uh, consumption would be having it, uh, you know, which, would, which would create a better opportunity uh, going into the next fiscal year. In the terms of uh, the Chinese market, we have been... Sorry, we have been encountering a, a very uh, slow uh, demand from there, uh, same as the rest of the ma other markets, mainly on the uh, mainly with regard to the inventories uh, which are there uh, in that market, and 
hopefully the Chinese Spring Festival or the Chinese New Year, which is upcoming in the month of uh, February, uh, similar to the holiday sales in the rest of the world, we do look forward for some good consumption during the Chinese uh, New Year time um, uh, as we go uh, towards that in February when most of the consumption happens in China. And we are looking positively for that, uh, even though our major market, uh, China is not part of our major markets, uh, but still that is uh, most of which will take care of the commodity shrimp and the global uh, supply, which is being uh, created. With coming to that term of uh, shrimp supply, uh, as, at the global level, sorry, of course, uh, Ecuador shrimp supply some pressure on realizations. However, from a competitive positioning perspective, India is still ahead, both on costs as well as value-added products. We see we see an opportunity uh, that this combination of factors eases out over the next. Uh, um, you know, over the next couple of months, and uh, and we should have a better second half of the year. Of course, subject to the supply situations with regard to the stocking at the ponds, and also the availability of the shrimp supply. This is with regard to the uh, supply part. Uh, lastly, in conclusion, I would like to add uh, that to address these challenges and to ensure the optimum utilization of our facilities. We have uh, taken steps to explore uh, other markets, new markets, which also uh, we have uh, explained mainly focusing on the markets outside USA too and focusing more on the Europe uh, and other East European markets along with the UK market as well. Uh, this strategic move will not only diversify our revenue stream, but that would also enhance our resilience in the face of the market fluctuations which are, which are currently prevailing. Uh, however, uh, it's important to note that while we are entering these new markets, we re remain cautiously optimistic about the overall market scenario. This applies to both demand trends and, of course, the uh, uh, raw shrimp uh, within the country, which I uh, just explained, uh, especially considering the complexities surrounding shrimp production in India. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, I now open the floor for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, please press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants are requested to press star and one to join the question queue. First question is from the line of Sadat, who's an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask three questions. Sadat, uh, uh, is it possible for you to use the handset mode in case of you're using the speaker mode? Okay. To ask three questions. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I would like to ask three questions. Hello? Yes, please. Ah, okay. So, in the annual report 2023, uh, it shows that during the period of from 2021 to 23, the a company has exited from almost 1,500 acres of shrimp farming. 
Okay, so I would like to know what is the rationale behind it. Is it to cut operating cost? Uh, this was, Mr. Sizar, this was explained, uh, of course, in the past, uh, but it was mainly due to the uh, issue regarding the uh, management uh, of, because the farms were spread out over uh, various areas and uh, as it was quite uh, getting difficult to manage. So, and also with regard to the areas where the... the Okay, thanks. So, um, the, overall, so it, it was this. Hello. So, it, it, it's due to difficulty, yeah. difficulty in managing, and also the profitability. Okay. So, okay. in effect, it, in the company's profitability overall, and since the supply of shrimp was quite. Uh, very much uh, available during that time. This was during COVID time when this had happened primarily, especially in the year 2020, most of the farms were exited. And uh, that was uh, at that point of time when it was uh, really a challenge also. So we couldn't uh, really uh, continue that. And we have decided to exit uh, out of those, that operation. Okay. Uh, uh, so the next question I have is, like, do you have a, uh, like a broad idea with regards to what is happening uh, with Ecuadorian shrimp production? Is it declining or is it still increasing? Well, uh, we, I think I, we did mention in our uh, opening remarks, uh, yes, the supply from Ecuador has been there uh, quite consistent. And uh, as of now, we see... Uh, we hear that they are having issues with regard with regard to the uh, same uh, with regard to the viability of uh, at the farm level with regard to costs as uh, they definitely have higher costs uh, and with where the global shrimp pricing is it is having an impact so we would uh, we are definitely uh, looking to see the net impact of this uh, at the Ecuadorian supply level more into the year 2024. And uh, they also, uh, we, we believe that, we strongly believe that they have realized the actual amount of market space which is available for such a supply. I mean, whether it is feasible or not, whether the market space can actually accommodate. Uh, we are pretty confident that also have realized and um, with the current situation, um, they are also looking forward for course corrections on their end. And we are confident that that will definitely have an impact in uh, kind of uh, easing out the aggressive supply, or sorry, production at attitude and approach which Ecuador has taken. And we are in the year 2024. Okay. So uh, one more question I have is... Um, uh, may we request you to return to the question queue for any follow-up questions as there are several other participants waiting for that. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Thanks. Uh, just a reminder to participants that uh, please restrict your questions to two per participant. In case if you have any follow-up questions, you can always rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of uh, Nitin Avasti from Incred Equities. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, just one question regarding the recent development in Ecuador. So the government, uh, there has been a massive change in the government policies towards the shrimp industry. And uh, the industry tried to represent and said that, you know, power subsidies are required for the companies to sustain profitability, but however, the government has scrapped it, and now at least the data which they are putting out says that uh, this is going to be a 10% cost impact. Uh, are we seeing that right now? Because that is the law has gone through, the subsidies are revoked by the government. Uh, are we seeing Ecuador go on the back foot and, you know, ask for higher prices just to make up for that 10% cost price? Yeah, Mr. Nitin, I, as uh, I think you would have... Uh, understood that which I just uh, responded to the earlier uh, 
participant to um, with regard to the viability at the farm uh, gate pricing, I mean, at the, at the farm level, uh, whether it is related to the withdrawal of the diesel subsidy, which was there for many years from the government of Ecuador, or, you know, uh, other supports which were extended by their government to that industry to the to the industry uh in the country in the country of ecuador uh end of the day definitely it is uh, will be having uh the impact its impact uh, uh on the viability at the farm level and uh well and we would we are not yet seeing that at this time and uh, as i mentioned earlier also to the other uh, participant is that we are uh, expecting the impact to be there more into the calendar year 2024, which is just in a few months, because the new production uh, planning, which will also be happening now. Uh, so definitely all uh, on the future production or the future stocking of shrimp at the pond level, definitely uh, there should be an impact with the way the cost uh, escalation will be there and uh, certain supports not being there from their uh, respective government will definitely have an impact, and that is more to be seen and watched for, um, I mean, uh, into the calendar year 2024, for sure. Yeah. Understood, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aman, Aman Madrecha from Augmenta Asset Managers, LLP. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I joined the call a little late. So, sir, just wanted to know uh, how is the scenario on the supply side on the domestic front? Like, uh, since the last two years, the farmers are reeling with low farm gate prices and because of higher feed prices also, there are various ups and downs that are happening. So, like, some sense on how are the farmers, uh, uh, like, dealing with the facts uh, about the stem farming that is going on? since last two years would help and how are the farm kit prices behaving recently or like over the past few months? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, uh, hello. 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 Yeah. Can you hear? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So with regard to the farmers in uh, India, well, uh, like it is, it has been the scenario everywhere around the world. Uh, the costs, uh, the higher costs, um, uh, definitely uh, have been a um, you know mood spoiler uh, for uh, the farmers, as such, uh, to look at uh, uh, in an aggressive manner, which was the case in the past. But now, there has been uh, corrections and changes of strategies in the way. They stock in their in their ponds. So compared to the past, uh, that aggressiveness is not there. But however, they are going it uh, going in a more uh, uh, slow and steady basis, where they are wait, waiting and watching the scenario. And uh, currently, of course, the prices have been uh, around uh, the same as they were in the earlier quarters. Uh, not much of a uh, significant change. It has been hovering, hovering around an average of around uh, 300 rupees uh, um, plus or minus around uh, 10 rupees approximately. I'm just giving an average between all the sizes. This is, of course, this was for the company, but that, uh, of course, which was a mix of uh, all the sizes which were available in the market. And uh, so the average uh, prices also are, have been the same almost uh, pretty much uh, not with not a during the year current year uh, that is 2023 and not signi no significant increase or reduction and uh, the farmers uh, overall approach has been quite uh, slow but uh, as we can see and as we we our companies has been reiterating from the past that uh, the supply mood uh, or the supply environment or the mood of the farmers or the primary producers definitely... The person will... you are speaking with has put your call on hold. Please stay. Hello? Hello? Uh, I'm sorry for that, sir. Please continue. Yes, yeah, sorry. 
So the supply scenario uh, and also the overall mood of the farmers has been a little bit uh, subdued, especially during the current year. With how it is moving in tandem with how the global demand is, because whether it is from the U.S. market, the EU, or the Chinese market, overall the major markets for India, and of course uh, this year also the uh, the farmers are growing rather slow, and their costs. Uh, There has been changes in the farmers' approach of the sizes what and the stocking densities which they have been planning, which was the case from the beginning of this year. This whole year they have been uh, have been evaluating the scenario, the current market scenario, and they have changed. They have been changing their strategies. Many farmers have actually uh, reduced the number of uh, stock the stocking densities which were there, which which are there for the uh, for the ponds. And uh, they have been uh, making changes to their uh, farm uh, production planning as per the market uh, conditions. But overall, the mood of the farm, the primary producers, uh, is rather subdued because of the current market uh, dynamics. Uh, and that definitely uh, could be looking uh, looking on a positive side once the demand at least picks up a little bit more in the next year as once the global, um, you know, inventories or the backlog of inventories which are sitting in, in, at the customers, at the consumer end are consumed over the next few months between now to all the way, almost till March, that should have some uh, positive sign created for the farmers too. And of course, we are also waiting and watching with how uh, the Ecuadorian supply also would be there just mentioned for the, with the earlier uh, participants will also depend on but for all the farmers uh, interest is rather uh, subdued and they have uh, changed their approach and their strategy of uh, I mean with the number of shrimp on the size is what they harvest or the, the precise more precisely the number of days they would uh, conduct uh, a crop cycle that they, these kind of factors have been definitely been affected, and they, they have been changing their uh, strategy based on uh, to the market dynamics, to be precise. Okay, sir, that is helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of uh, Yoganj Jaiswani from Mittal Analytics. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, Mr. Uh, so, a couple of questions. So, uh, like you were just mentioning about how the industry in, in India is managing with the volatility uh, prices and how farmers are uh, being very cautious. Now, uh, given the uh, processors, all the processors have put up capacity and uh, for last two, three years they have been struggling. So, uh, as an industry or as a company, what all can we do to uh, safeguard ourselves or are there any uh, more efforts that are going into it uh, to you know, better utilize these capacities? Well, uh, the capacity uh, which have been uh, expanded overall uh, with regard to the industry in general or if, I, if we go more towards specific to the company, we have uh, like whatever capacity of exp uh, expansion ha has been done over the past two to three years, including our say let us say the ready treat capacity. So each company uh, has taken uh, with decisions with regard to capacity expansion, uh, considering their uh, market uh, um, scenarios or their business um, environment uh, in. Uh, Hopefully, in, in context to that, and with regard to our uh, uh, specific uh, company, we focused mainly on the uh, ready-to-eat uh, capacity expansion, which was uh, the 5,000 metric tons, um, which, of course, unfortunately, we are, as we did mention in our opening remarks, one of the major point which is affecting our ready-to-eat product uh, volume uh, growth 
has um, is also the uh, access to the EU market with regard to that product. Uh, uh, even today, as we speak, our new facility which has opened, not just the ready to eat, I'm sorry to say this, but the ready to cook capacity also, uh, that is uh, the entire uh, 20,000 uh, sorry, uh, 25,000 metric tons, including the ready-to-eat expansion, which happened last year, is not available for the EU market. So, I mean, uh, which means even though, I mean, the EU being our uh, second largest market and uh, that market being supportive for our business, even in the present uh, dire situations or uh, like the bad environment with or you know with regard to the US, US market and overall global market scenario but EU has been a positive factor the Europe market has been a positive factor for our company's business however as on date uh, due to the lack of the regulatory approval and which we have been waiting continuously for the past three years Almost 25,000 uh, 25, metric tons of our capacity is not available for uh, business to EU. Not That is not just ready to eat, but ready to cook also. That is specific to our company. And now, in regard to the general overall industry scenario, yes, uh, various companies have uh, taken up uh, capacity expansions, uh, which uh, uh, we are uh, confident that it must be more based on their uh, business strategy and how uh, the different markets which they plan to or the different products which they are planning to expand, uh, export, uh, whether uh, it could be the ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat, or even further value-added with regard to breading, etc. So it depends on how those um, you know, decisions have been taken and how the, the, their investments have been made. But uh, uh, we are pretty confident that the capacity expansion decision is more in would be more in line with the way how their uh, company respective co- company's business has been going in in the direction in which it has been going in. And uh, since we cannot generally, uh, I mean, answer about how the rest of the companies have evaluated or decided their capacity expansion plans, but uh, as mentioned specific to our company, uh, this was the scenario, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we are uh, caught between the uh, procedures uh, which are uh, which has never been in the past. There's so much uh, delay uh, for uh, various reasons between uh, government to government negotiations and various other uh, issues which are there. But we are still uh, positive. The last uh, 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 rep- response which we got from the EU uh, health authorities is also is that the discussions are on and they could get finalized along with uh, this is all happening along with the uh, f- the free trade agreement or discussions also which are happening between India and EU. Uh, so once that happens uh, with regard to the free trade agreement. Uh, not only and also our uh, factory approvals getting completed. This this will also actually uh, enable our country as well as our country India in general to have a uh, you know a better uh, advantage because currently our products to the EU market are uh, subject to uh, duties uh, between four to nine percent, uh, which is in the case of ready to eat products it is nine percent duties are there. Um, and in the case of ready to cook, it is four percent. So the, these uh, duties also, uh, once uh, they are addressed with regard to the free trade agreement, with regard to in the EU market, uh, uh, definitely that will help us overall uh, with regard to our sales, and uh, look forward to uh, the market of European Union as. Uh, a major market for our for our uh, company uh, for sure. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry we are able to answer more regarding to our company specific of how our capacity uh, is uh, capacity expansion is to be addressed, and um, we are not specifically able to answer with regard to the overall industry scenario which you have been uh, questioning specifically. Yeah, but that is the hey, sir, uh, that, that was a really uh, helpful answer. Uh, so secondly, uh, like you mentioned that there are duties on RT and RTC in European markets. Uh, again, we are seeing that there are some news articles floating around that 
operating around that there could be duties uh, on on the US side of the business as well. So, what is your uh, view on it? Are we expecting some uh, duties to uh, you know come in on the US business as well? Well, uh, the US uh, market uh, is uh, looking at. Uh, there's a petition in the U.S. Uh, government to levy countervailing duties, not just on Indian shrimp, uh, but uh, the case, the petition has been filed on uh, India, uh, Vietnam, Ecuador, and Indonesia. Uh, in regard to Ecuador and Indonesia, there has been an additional petition with regard to the anti-dumping duty also on those two countries, which has not been the case. Uh, until now. Uh, so in the case of India and Vietnam, it is going to be, the petition is about countervailing duty, uh, which is countervailing duties are more about the subsidies or any sort of incentives being given by the respective uh, countries to their uh, industry, to support their industry. And of course, depending on whether uh, such subsidies or any sort of incentives or any, um, you know, drawback or anything, whether it, they are counterweighable or not is a separate topic, which are which will be deliberated and discussed by the Indian uh, government as well as the U.S. government, and I mean the respective country governments and the U.S. government. Uh, as I said, said they are men planning to levy... Uh, Uh, and Vietnam, and they are planning to levy countervailing duty along with anti-dumping duty on Ecuador and Indonesia. So, uh, well, uh, they have did even around 10 years ago. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, were, uh, we actually uh, got out of it. Uh, so there was no countervailing duty affected. Subsequently, after the proceedings and various arguments between the government and the industry at that point of time. Uh, so we should see how this will go along uh, in the year 2024, uh, because most of the proceedings are going to start. Uh, and actually, they are underway right now, and they are going to be uh, more coming to a concrete stage or the final stage in the early part of 2024 uh, and later. I mean, by middle of 2024, we should have a uh, better uh, clarity with, with, with some preliminary duties being levied, if any. Uh, I mean, whatever they're going to be levied uh, sometime in March and March 2024. And finally, uh, the decision about uh, whether to levy these duties or continue them will be taken up more towards the later part of the year, uh, 2024. But uh, as you can see, uh, India and Vietnam are going to have countervailing duties uh, additionally if we have it based on the final decision of the U.S. government, the Depart U.S. Department of Commerce. They are more in relation to uh, any sort of subsidies or incentives which are received by the industry. And if they are countervailable, uh, sorry, countervailable then, then the duties will be uh, levied. Otherwise, they may not be levied. So it is dependent on... Uh, discussions, deliberations, and workings between the governments, the respective governments, as well as the industry and the government uh, of the U.S. With regard to EU and Indonesia, the biggest change will be that uh, they will also be having additional anti-dumping duties which are there. For now, that is what the petitions have been filed in the U.S. government. So see how this will uh, affect uh, whether, uh, I mean, with the way, the, as mentioned, with two types of duties being acquired or which was there until now from the U.S. side, whether it is level playing field for the rest of the players like India, Vietnam, example, uh, or uh, whether it will be, um, you know, in a in a different way, we'll have to watch as uh, nothing has been uh, formalized or finalized yet, and still it is uh, just in the initial process stage. We will not be able to give the exact details, and hopefully, in the future, uh, when we go to the you know in our next uh, uh, investor calls or, or quarterly con calls, as we get more details, we'll definitely be able to give out those details. But uh, currently, uh, as we mentioned. Uh, um, we think it's going to be more of a level playing field for uh, 
uh, all markets and uh, the impact of it uh, should be looked at more on i mean of course on the uh, market side in the usa mostly because uh, it is a subject it is a us specific subject us is a specific sub, uh, subject of additional countervailing duties at all uh, and it is not uh, glo- it's not going to affect globally means other countries are not having that same uh, issue so uh, we should see how things will uh, uh, you know pan out over the next uh, few months or rather next few quarters we'll have more clarity on this uh, hopefully by then in our next quarterly con call possibly that's what we are expecting that will really help you sir one last question from my side and i'm talking to you Uh, so, like you mentioned about the European Union uh, audit of our facilities. So, in terms of the entire process, where are we exactly? Have they visited our facilities so far, or uh, that is pending entirely? And if they have visited, visited no, no. what was their observation? So, the, uh, with regard to that, the the approval process is the pending more because of the delay. on the eu side and the european union side and it is more of a diplomatic or political rather decisions which are pending between the governments between the eu council in brussels and the indian government and it has less to do with uh, visiting of facilities as all the facilities which have been constructed and uh, commissioned for uh, production in the past 3 3 and a half years almost uh, have been uh, approved by the government of india uh, uh, as following the eu norms and keep it having everything in order however the decision has been kept pending at the eu council side which as i as we mentioned it is more of a diplomatic uh, you know um, negotiations or rather it's more of a government to government deliberations so we i mean we we don't have the full clarity on that but end of the day the decision is nothing to do with any visits pending from the eu side it is got more to do with uh, whether or not facilities have to be approved by the eu and we don't know i we can't i can't comment about what the eu council is looking for to get from government of india to be precisely answering your question we don't know what they are looking for so as i said it is more of a trade level discussions and in, in that discussions apart from the approvals of shrimp processing industries in india there is also an fta discussions which are in place all this are in going on right now so we don't know what are the the finer points of those negotiations between the government to government uh, deliberations but there has nothing to do this this approval has nothing to do with any visit pending from the eu council uh in the past 3 and a half years this had more to do with a, a decision making to be done at the eu uh and m- maybe they are waiting for some sort of a response or uh, some sort of a you know uh i don't know by any positive response for their products we don't know much of that detail but it's more of a government to government level discussion and nothing to do with the facilities as such hello what is uh, that was really a good question thank you the next question is from the line of jagdeep walia from clockwine capital please go ahead uh hello sir thanks for taking my question uh, sir i just want your thoughts on uh, how do india and ecuador compare as far as cost of production is concerned if we consider ready to cook shrimp uh first thing uh, mr jagdeep is that uh in the case of ready to cook also ecuador is mostly into uh commodity pro- products produced as of as of now uh which mainly mainly into the commodity based products which are they are mainly focused on head on whole shrimp to china head on shrimp uh, and headless shrimp to certain extent to uh their main markets of course is china and european union with regard to head on shrimp and they also produce headless shrimp uh 
which is the next uh, part in the uh, from the basic category of uh, products, finished products. And uh, of late, they have been looking at producing other uh, ready-to-cook products. Also, by the way, they are also producing some ready-to-eat products. Also, however, uh, with regard to the costs, uh, because of uh, mainly with regard to the um, you know manpower resources which are constrained uh, in Ecuador, they are trying to depend on uh, machines. Uh, um, you know, they are uh, trying to depend on machines and trying to. Uh, get the, that uh, production uh, into place with using machines. But if machines could have taken up the various value addition activities with regard to shrimp products, that could have been done long ago and uh, because uh, that affects the uh, overall yields which are present, uh, which, which has to be achieved with regard to uh, producing these products from uh, raw material stage to the fine, uh, finished end products, final products. So the yields uh, could be, would be impacted actually. And uh, overall, definitely because of uh, lack of uh, pr- proper manpower resources available to them, uh, and they are constrained with regard to the scale of uh, uh, to the the volumes which they can produce with regard to uh, more of uh, more value added products with regard, with regard to ready to cook or uh, uh, also ready to eat and they are definitely constrained uh, their major products uh, which are which they export is in head on shell on mostly um, and for the volumes which they have been producing over the past few years two three years also uh, that wouldn't be possible if they are not producing uh, head-on shell on, which is the base for them to do any uh, further activities other than freezing the shrimp as it is without doing anything. So that makes it easy for them to handle such uh, volumes. Uh, that's how it was the case until now, until a few years. But now with the volume growth in at the farm-level production, which Ecuador is going through, uh, and it is quite difficult for them to produce these other uh, ready-to-cook products as well as ready-to-eat products. So it is becoming a challenge for sure. Cost of production for them is uh, because of the lack of uh, manpower resources and depending more on, I mean, if they want to do it, they are trying to address it with machines. Definitely it is going to be more expensive. Uh, compared to the Asian uh, producing uh, countries, whether it is India, Vietnam, Indonesia, or Thailand. Uh, I mean, at, at least in India, Vietnam, and Indonesia are at a much better place because of the access to a vast uh, amount of uh, skilled labor pool or the work of work for, um, uh, manpower resources which are accessible to these countries. Uh, uh, me, sir, on this point, yeah. sir, you, you broadly you are saying that uh, there is uh, constraints on the availability of labor in Ecuador to produce ready to cook products. Uh, then how are they? How have they gained so much share in the U.S. market? I can understand they're doing well in China market, but how have they gained so much share in the U.S. market if they are not competitive uh, on production they of uh, ready to cook products? U.S. market is not a new market for them. One of the major points which the selling points for them, uh, uh, to the U.S. market is, of course, the transit or the sailing time, which you, if you notice this carefully, uh, from Asia, from India to U.S., if it takes around minimum of four to six weeks of sailing time, which means for good shift from U.S., from India to U.S.A., if it is uh, four to six weeks for Ecuador, it is one week. So Sorry. one of the reasons why that, that is more on the sales front, uh, where the preference from some customers looking at uh, to you know, uh, let us say for the some of the customers to look at the Ecuadorian market for these products uh, was mainly on that front. But however. As we mentioned, they are constrained with regard to producing large-scale uh, or large-volume products in more of the products which are required for the U.S. market. They are they are constrained. They are for the production level what they have uh, of uh, more than one million metric tons. 
if they focus they or if they want the uh, at least 50% of their production to be in uh, you know more of value added products it is definitely a challenge for them that is really and from the beginning not today but for many years they have been mainly focused on head on shell on shrimp which is whole shrimp uh, which with not much of value addition uh, involved but in the pa- in the last 2 to 3 years or 4 years as their production started increasing at the farm level they have been focusing on other products too but as we mentioned and we reiterate there are there have been challenges until now in scaling up the production of value added products even in ready to cook not only in ready to eat even in ready to cook which means peeled products etc for markets like usa or canada or european union their major product I got your point, sir. is head on uh, correct sir uh, so how does the cost of labor compare between ecuador and india we don't have specific information with regard to cost of labor in ecuador but uh, because of the uh, access to overall manpower human resources in ecuador being lesser and also the policies with regard to the socialist government which is present there uh, there have been challenges in the you know uh, in the way they could uh, scale up their uh, volumes in the required products of certain markets like the usa for example and uh, there uh, and they are also looking that we understand they are also looking at getting them processed in other countries of south america because of lack of availability of labor so even though we don't get into specific numbers with uh, with regard to the question you have asked about the exact cost of production uh, labor uh, at the uh, cost of labor sorry um but overall it is a challenged uh, environment for them uh, uh, and definitely um, because of lack of man which was the main advantage for the asian countries so that is a challenge uh, for them and uh, we think that is keeping them constrained for sure in literally exploiting the market potential in the west in the western markets that's what right, yeah so just yeah. final question so what's the employee cost as a percentage of sales for your company uh, i can see the the numbers which are which come under the employee cost line item but is there any contract labor uh, element which is appearing in other expenses no i mean that is very uh, the major part of uh, costs are of course in uh, uh the employee cost with in the contract labor uh we we have uh, in the other expenses we have a uh, for the quarter we have a prox 1 minute uh, mr prasad uh, our uh, uh, fine from the finance department he will be able to answer our component intended uh, with regard to the contract employee in other expenses what is the amount of uh, contract, uh, contract labor sorry amir sir Shortly, uh, for a half year, 2.24. 2.24 crores for the for six months. Uh, okay, for the quarter, yeah. uh, for, for the quarter. For the half year, sir. For the quarter. No, no. For the quarter, what is it for the quarter? Q2. One crore only. One crore uh, approximately. Yeah, it's one crore uh, in the other expenses. Got it, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. That's all from my side. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next follow up uh, sorry the next question is from the line of uh, Vaibhav Kapoor who is an individual investor please go ahead uh, my questions have been answered thank you right thank you so much the next follow up question is from the line of Siddharth please go ahead hi sir uh, thanks for taking this question uh, i uh, the, in the fi 23 the total number of employees uh, the working in the company had declined uh, quite significantly my question is can apex uh, as a company achieve optimum utilization of 70 75% with the present number of employees or do, do we have to hire more people it, uh, with the current strength uh, achieving a 70 75% uh, will be difficult with the products which the company uh, looks forward to export or process and export definitely 
when we are looking at uh, achieving a 70 to 75 percent capacity utilization, of course, uh, depending on the markets and supply, keeping that as a point aside, uh, yes, there will be addition of uh, employees also uh, when it when it comes to such a stage. We cannot do with just with the current uh, employee strength or current worker strength precisely. One just one more question. Um, like uh, you did mention about um, you you being in talks with a leading importer in Japan. So, uh, like, is there any update? Uh, Sorry, uh, that was not our. We, we we didn't say we have been in talks with a leading importer in Japan. But and and uh, for breaded shrimp. No, no, that was not our company. Maybe uh, that was uh, I don't know. It was, it was not from uh, Apex. Okay. It's not sure, sure, sure. Fine. So thanks a lot. Uh, wish you all the best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question is from the line of uh, Nikhil from UM Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I have two questions. Question number one uh, is... Uh, how do you see the impact of the super El Nino expected next year? Will it hurt uh, our business or will it hurt the businesses in the Latin American countries? That's one. And uh, second question is, how are we placed in terms of the availability of this fish meal and other things? So basically, the inputs. Uh, Thank you, sir. To answer your first, Rutia, to answer your first question, um, we have uh, understood uh, uh, from uh, some of our uh, um, industry players in Ecuador that um, they are expecting uh, um, some big impact with regard to El Nino um, in Ecuador, especially in Latin America, like you rightly pointed out, in the Latin America uh, producing nations, which includes uh, Ecuador, uh, which is one of the it is one of the largest producers of uh, uh, shrimp products in, in our industry as of today. And uh, we un do understand from various uh, information available uh, from their statements being made that uh, El Nino could impact them uh, in a big way. That's what we understand. But we, don't, we do not know the extent of such an impact uh, going forward uh, as of now. But we have been told, or we have been, uh, you know, informed uh, from various channels that uh, they are looking to have uh, quite a big impact with regard to El Nino on their uh, operations uh, at the uh, at the farm level and you know at the production stage. That is what we understand, and uh, that is regarding your first question. And the second question, we do not have much to answer about the uh, shrimp feed. Uh, uh, cost or the fish meal cost, uh, the input cost in the shrimp feed activity as our company is not into shrimp feed manufacturing. Um, I think that question was meant for other uh, players in the industry. Uh, so please excuse us on that part. Okay. I think that answers the questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thakur. So thank you one and all for uh, making it uh, to our uh, Q2 uh, FY2, H1 FY24 uh, quarterly con call. Uh, and uh, for any queries, uh, you can always uh, reach out to us at on the email address ir at apexfrozenfoods.com. And uh, thank you once again, and have a nice day. Thank you. On behalf of Apex, Apex Frozen Foods, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your line.